He was a pastor and activist. She was a strong Chickasaw who played a vital role in preserving the Chickasaw language. Together, they went from the pulpit to the presses. Jesse and Vinnie Mae Sadie Humes, inspiring examples of Chickasaw leaders and legacies. He was a man on horseback, riding alone along remote country roads. A weekly routine with a different destination each week, but the same mission, preaching the gospel and a message of Chickasaw tribal unity. This is an indelible image in the story of Jesse Humes. My mother kept a lot of articles and things that he had published and, and um, were written about him. And so I have those in position now. Reverend Jesse Humes and his service to the Chickasaw people rose to prominence under the presidential appointment of Governor Douglas Johnston. It was an era of transition in the early 20th century, when the Chickasaw government was severely restricted and challenged. The kind of challenges that can inspire a man's life mission. Sometimes I just get out the book and just read his handwritten letters that he wrote to Governor Johnston and, and see how hard he worked to gather the citizens at the time to come together to create our new government. These leaders who feel like the Chickasaw people are their own families and they want to take care of them. And I think that Jess Humes really acted within that role. My grandfather is very connected to the Chickasaw people and it was important that he convey that to Governor Johnston at the time that they were on their mission to get the tribal politics in order. Reverend Jesse Humes, well known amongst the Chickasaw communities, was a pivotal figure in the years leading up to the renewal of tribal self-determination. He traveled mile after mile to provide sermons to Chickasaw congregations scattered through the countryside of South Central Oklahoma. This was no easy endeavor. He connected friends, families, and the larger tribal community during a time when phones were few and far between and much of the news shared was by word of mouth. My memory of Jess Humes is a tall man being on a pulpit at Yellow Springs Church, standing in front of a congregation that was very small. I spent a lot of Sundays at Yellow Spring, at revivals there. There were no automobiles back at that time, and he rode horseback to his uh, congregations and the circuit that he covered. So he uh, was well respected according to my family and everyone around the area there. And uh, they thought the world of Jess Humes. I think he had that personality or persona that people gravitated to. When we look at the role of the churches, um, there is nothing in the Chickasaw Nation that can pull together the community other than a church. Back then, it was where you learned your genealogy. It's where you learned who you are related to and who you're not related to. It might even be a place where you learn what clan you are. It's a place where you learn how to cook traditional foods because we always had meals at the church. And we'd stick them up here in City Chapel and we would ride wagon here. And Jess would preach, women on one side, men on the other. And he'd say, okay, so now you women's get over there, so we want y'all to pray loud so we can hear y'all. You know, there was a vision that he, that he shared with, with everybody that he came in contact with, and not just politicians or the leaders of the community, but um, every one of us. Jess would preach and he would preach in Chickasaw for a while, and then he'd speak English back and forth like that all through the whole church service. The one word that I remembered that always kept coming out in these sermons was Abba Benili. 
and I, I looked that word up and it means divine spirit, Holy Spirit. And I'm thinking, gosh, that's kind of incredible. I got the message and it wasn't even in a language I knew. <laughs> and I've remembered that since, since I was a small child. He was such a large man and he's deep voice. And um, people just tend to gather around him. I think he was very connected with the Chickasaw people and that uh, he not only had, uh, he had a driving force behind him and, and a mission and a vision. And he instilled that upon everybody that he came in contact with. I know Jess used to like to talk to my daddy and uh, they would get a chair and get under a tree and, uh, and they would just sit there and just talk and tell stories of a long time ago. His was more than just preaching and meeting the needs of all the Chickasaw's people in, in the grassroots movement. He was listening to the people and what they wanted at that time. And he was the one that, sometimes the one that made it happen. His relationships and connections with the Chickasaw people were vitally important during this time of change and transition. It would have been much easier to do nothing, but he and others in the community had a better vision for a government that would be more responsive to the Chickasaw people. You know, they became increasingly disaffected with the relationship between the federal government and our people and wanted more of a say. I think this was sort of the environment that Jess kind of grew out of, you know. Trying to get the people together to come here to Sealy's Chapel to just express how much they uh, wanted the government to come together. He was unhappy after Douglas Johnston passed away, and he wanted our people to have a real say in, you know, who was gonna govern us. I think he and his contemporaries felt like there was a better way to do it than we, than we had been. And I, I guess as a young child, I realized his importance then. Everybody knows that he was a circuit preacher. Everybody knows that he was a political activist. Maybe they don't know the hours that he spent in the fields because that's what he did to keep food on the table for us. She was a pillar of the community in her own right and mother of a man who would have lasting impact on the Chickasaw Nation, Vinnie Mae Seeley James married Jesse Humes in 1956. And I never called her Vinny. I always called her Sadie or Miss Humes. Everybody called her Sadie. And anybody that knew her well called her Sadie. Sadie was so kind, and uh, all the women's, every church just loved her. She just had this smile that whenever she smiled at you, you just felt good. To me, she was tall and she had this voice where if she wanted you to understand, she made a point by that voice. My grandmother was a very special lady. She was self-educated. She was an independent, resourceful lady. She raised her children by herself. They really loved the people. And I think everybody knew them so well. Jesse Humes was rooted in the community. He saw firsthand the poverty, the problems that federal termination, relocation, and assimilation policies had created. And he was determined to do what he could to bring about real change. I believe Jess would, would see it as a concept of, all right, I'm one person and I'm on this campaign to get things changed, but I'm just one person. So what we need is more people, more people to do things and to get involved and get things done. Jess Humes is really strongly associated with this grassroots movement that, um, or some people call it the Sealy Chapel movement, that grew out of this, this sense of disaffection in the 50s. Termination policies of the 1950s added fuel to his fire and strengthen his resolve to take action. Humes agreed with the adage that the pen was mightier than the sword and began a campaign of letter writing. They weren't long letters, but they were up to the point 
where he made his point why he needed to meet with them or to uh, get a group, a committee, to uh, come and speak with the governor and the president. He wrote letters to Oklahoma's congressional delegation. He wrote a letter to President Harry Truman, which went unanswered. He pushed for change and didn't stop when obstacle after obstacle was put in his path. And in fact, I did not know at the, at the time how important Jess was in his role in the tribe and, and what his vision was. Because people would come and, and, and speak to Jess. I wasn't privy to that conversation because lots of times they'd just go out on the porch and talk. But I had no earthly idea what all those discussions were about. And it was actually memorable and historical. He inspired and mentored Overton James, who ultimately would become Governor Overton James. He was the one who got Daddy interested in tribal politics. He took Daddy to churches, anywhere a small gathering of people would be, he took him there. And so he introduced him to the people. And he, at one point, asked Daddy if he would be interested in, in seeking the appointment of governor. Please place your hand on the Bible and raise your right hand. I state your name. I, Overton James. Do solemnly swear or affirm. In 1963, Overton James was appointed governor by President John F. Kennedy. When he was appointed governor of Chickasaw Nation, everybody was happy because they knew him and they knew him as being educated. He was educated, but like so many of his generation, he was not taught the Chickasaw language. And he believed the continuation of the language was so important and such a priceless part of Chickasaw culture. He needed to do something. It was an issue that needed to be addressed. My grandmother did not teach her children to speak Chickasaw. And the reason why she didn't was she told all of them, you're gonna to have to live in a white man's world. And he truly loved his mother and he respected his mother. And she was a driving force behind his success. Which might be one reason he turned to his mother and Jesse Humes to begin a daunting task to preserve a language that had never been published to preserve our culture and our heritage and our language. And then that's why he approached my grandmother and Jess about writing the dictionary. With grandmother and Jess, whenever they began writing the dictionary, I know that Uncle Brug inspired them, Overton inspired them, because he thought it was very important to preserve the language. So the Humes Dictionary, this one right here, this is a copy my granny gave me back when I was a little boy. I mean, I think, you know, her, her son, um, Governor James, was a really dynamic person. And this was one of those, you know, wonderful tools of a cultural revitalization. And he put that forward, um, you know, in some of his very first policy positions, you know, it mattered. It was their own initiative. It was their own effort, their own will, their own value of this language, which is so deeply a part of who we are. That's why they did it. And it wasn't a linguist from out of state or something like this. It was them, you know, some native speakers sitting down and saying, all right, let's, let's do this. And they did it. So with an English dictionary as a guide, a kitchen table and iron resolve, the work began. My memories of Granddad Sadie working on the dictionary with just gathered around the kitchen table and working the reel to reel, uh, recording it and then writing it down. Because she would say, well, it said this way in Chickasaw, and he would say that in Choctaw. Normally, things went smoothly. Have a word, you'd give the Chickasaw word, and you'd, you'd go on, and then Here's the next word. And Jess would say, so-and-so. Grandma would say, that's not right. And Jess would go, yeah, that's it. And Grandma said, no, that's Choctaw. You're speaking Choctaw. That's not right. But yeah, it's like, OK, do you say Holly Toe or do you say Chok Ma? And I would go, oh, my grandma would say Chok Ma. Don't be saying Holly Toe. <laughs> my understanding 
was that there was a lot of discussion about, well, is this a Chickasaw word? Is this a Choctaw word? I didn't realize the importance of what he was doing at the time, but I have that memory at least. You know, we talk about strong, dynamic Chickasaw women, and we come from a line of strong women. And Vinnie Mae, she was an extremely intelligent woman. But then, whenever I think about grandmother and Jess embarking on a project where you, you take an English dictionary and you say, OK, let's start with A, and think, oh, man, gosh, we got to go all the way to Z. I, I don't know. They, it was amazing how they did it. Sometimes in the summertime, I would go down and, and stay with them, you know, and th that didn't make any difference, you know. Sitting there at that table doing those words, you know, they just kept at it. But I heard it took two years, and they must have really worked night and day, 24 hours, to have gotten that book out in two years. Two and a half years later, uh, there was a dictionary. And the sad thing about it was that Jess didn't live long enough to see that. In 1966, as the first draft was being completed, tragedy struck. Jesse Humes had a fatal heart attack. I was the first one that she got on the phone. Once I remember my grandma crying, and that was when her older son died. But other than that, that was the only time that I had known of my grandma to cry. Vinnie Mae told people later that she almost gave up on the project after losing her husband. The strength that she had and the passion about preserving not only our language, but our heritage, that was, you could see that. It was like a glow. It took a very strong-willed woman to complete that dictionary after the death of her husband and to continue on, because that's daunting. I think in part it was probably a way of honoring her late husband at that time. And then once they got through with it, they found out that in order to publish it, it had to be a typewritten manuscript. So Daddy bought my grandmother an uh, old manual typewriter, and she had never typed in her life. So she taught herself how to type and typed the whole manuscript. I can picture him really encouraging her to finish the book because it was almost finished, and that it was going to be such a, a good thing for our young people and our children that's coming up to keep the Chickasaw language alive and going. The last time that I had visited her, and before we left, she said, I'll be walking the long road. And me and this other worker, we were surprised at what she said. We looked at each other. We knew what she was saying. And so that was the last time I seen her. And I'll always remember those words. Benny May passed away in 1996 at the age of 93. Anta is where you are temporarily, and Anta is where you live. The Hume's Dictionary has become a staple for fluent speakers and students of the language. And its impact will last for many generations to come. It's hard to find words the importance of the effort that they made. Now, I got this book in uh, 1989. I was 11. You know, my grandmother Uh, Charlie, who gave it to me, is dead. And she couldn't speak. She went to boarding school at Carter. It was a different time and a different place. And they just couldn't encourage it. They, they thought it was bad. I'm always talking about these connections to our past. And so, you know, you have this incredible history of, of loss and perseverance. You know, the, just that we had speakers, you know, 500 years after contact, 
when so many other people were, were are gone. And they cared so much about this that they made this for us. And then she cared so much about me that she gave it to me. The Humes were of that generation that managed to hold on to it. My grandmother was of that same generation. I know it's not just a book, you know, it's something. It's something a lot deeper than just words on a page. We have many, many other language resources that have been produced since then. This is just on a, you know, it's like a totally different level. You know, it's not the Bible, but man, it's awful close. Well, the fact that my grandmother and Jess wrote that dictionary and it was the first one and it was such a labor of love for them and it was a difficult task for them, but it makes me very, very proud to be part of a family that has done so much to develop the tribe and to preserve the heritage. And it just makes me very proud. We need to look to them and say, that's me. That's who I am. And be proud of being Chickasaw. Just knowing the time, the energy, and the passion that he had to put it together and work it through, it's very important, yeah. They have both left their mark on us. The fact that two people sitting around a, a kitchen table, my grandfather saying the words, Sadie typing the words. Listen 37, scene 37, take one. The fact that they have come from that dining room table to, my, ben Mano. to being on a Rosetta Stone application. I saw a grandfather through my eyes how proud he was to be a Chickasaw and telling us to be the same. So I think he'd be very proud that it's gone to where it has. I think the lasting legacy of Jess Humes and Vinnie Mae for Chickasaw people is that they are heroes for us. Boy, this is emotional. I think Jess Hume showed us that as Chickasaw people, even if we don't have anything at all, that, you know, we have to still strive and we have to still fight. So that legacy can be handed down to the next generation.